Okay, um, please have a seat. My name is Ulrich Diernagel. I'm a stroke researcher at the Charité, and I'm also a founding director of the Center for, stroke, the Center for uh, Transforming Biomedical Research at the BIH. And I'm welcoming you all, and obviously also all the panelists, um, to this session on big data in healthcare and um, biomedical research. Um, there have been never more opportunities to aggregate, to collect data on a massive scale in the health sector. Um, we can sequence our genomes, our microbiomes, um, at least theoretically we can um, collect and trace all the information that is exchanged between doctors and patients in electronic health records. Um, obviously, social media and, and our mobile devices deliver a lot of health-related data in terms of uh, activity, diet, social uh, contacts, and so forth, and, and tracking devices, mobile trackers, uh, now the new uh, Apple device, I think, even gives us uh, an EKG, and, and God knows what, what's to come. Yet, um, using this information to answer health-related uh, questions, uh, I think, is becoming more and more difficult. Um, and that is because the data is coming from different domains. It um, lives uh, in different infrastructures, and of course, it's also of very variable quality. Also, um, the massive collection and aggregation of personal data um, comes with a number of ethical, policy, um, methodological, technological um, challenges. And we should also not forget that the, the promise of big data in healthcare has yet to be confirmed um, by large-scale clinical evidence. So today we want to uh, explore not only the, um, the promises, uh, the opportunities, but also the challenges um, of big data in healthcare. And our panelists, I'm very glad, um, are experts in, I think, all the relevant domains that includes ethics, policy, funding, uh, practical issues, uh, and so forth. And just when we uh, started talking about the session, uh, I realized that the only stakeholder we are missing are patients, but then um, Roland Als uh, rightfully said um, we are all patients, so uh, at least at some point we will be patients. So I think we have uh, the, all the um, relevant expertise here. So um, the ground rules are very simple. Um, we will just start with uh, short statements uh, or, or at least one presentation. Um, and then I hope that we have a very lively uh, and, and maybe even controversial um, discussion. And I will make sure that uh, you, uh, the audience, also get your say and, and uh, can ask questions or make statements um, because I think we, have, we, we will have time for it. So um, without further ado, and we uh, just um, said that we are going to do this in an alphabetical order. There's no, uh, there's no special systematics behind that, um, so we, we are resorting to the alphabet. Um, so it, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce the first panelist. Uh, that's uh, Roland Eils. He is, uh, since April this year, he is the uh, professor for... Um, digital Health at the Berlin Institute of Health and also the founding director of the Digital Health Center at the Berlin Institute of Health. He's one of the major driving forces in Germany and I, I would guess in, beyond um, in implementing um, digital health. Um, and he's also the coordinator of uh, the a German medical informatics uh, consortium, HiMed, um, which is funded by the uh, German Ministry of Science and Education. So, Roland, we are looking forward to your statement. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Uli, for the introduction and also for the invitation. So, uh, when we were invited to this uh, discussion, 
um, we were asked to avoid as much as possible uh, the usual buzzwords and try to be more precise in terms of what could be the uh, could be the proven and also the potential benefits of big data analytics uh, in 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 health as in general. Now. I would like to start off with uh, uh, giving you a positive example where actually big data and an, uh, analytics actually made a dramatic change uh, uh, in the way how we diagnose and treat our cancer patients. Um, this is an example I would like to share with you from my earlier life as a cancer genomics uh, uh, expert at the German Cancer Research Center at the University Hospital in Heidelberg. And then thereafter, after this positive example, I would like to come uh, back to a, site, I mean, a statement Uli actually mentioned on passing by in his introductory comment that in theory we would have all the um, um, uh, data available uh, uh, which is required to bring together electronic health record data with uh, molecular data, imaging data and so forth. And I would like to talk a little bit about the theory and the practice. Now, let me start with the positive example. So in Heidelberg, we already, in 2013, which is uh, uh, five years ago, we decided to start a very ambitious program, which is that we would like to offer cancer genome sequencing as a commodity for diagnostics and therapy recommendation for all uh, patients who are treated at the National Center for Tumor Disease, which is a joint venture between the German Cancer Research Center and the University Hospital in Heidelberg. And this means in practice that we see around about 10,000 patients per year, and our rough estimate would be that about a third of them, so around about 3,000 out of those 10,000 patients, would benefit from the additional information we could derive from cancer genome sequencing. Now we started into this endeavor with completely not knowing and there was no historical data available which would kind of indicate whether or not from a, tech, a technical perspective we would be able to help in the diagnostics and treatment recommendation for those patients. And to our greatest surprise, in about 70% of those patients when we started this in 2013, we could already identify genetic alterations in individual cancer genomes of individual patients where a drug would be available which is FDA or has, has an approved uh, to be used in clinical practice. Now that was in terms of our technical success rate was very high and we translated this then into, uh, into molecular tumor boards where our recommendations together with the recommendations by, uh, by pathologists, uh, by our oncologists and so forth would be, uh, would be visited side by side and and round about in a third of, uh, of all cases are simply genomics and computationally guided diagnostic and therapy recommendation was translated in a genomics guided um, treatment. Now, the question is, do we, with this kind of uh, um, uh, genomics guided uh, clinical uh, management, do we better than standard of care? Of course, you need to run clinical trials actually to prove this, but from, uh, um, from the data which we have collected from the last three or four years, we can tell that uh, the clinical success rate in terms of stabilization of disease at the very least is, uh, is at least uh, no, uh, no worse than, um, than uh, based on uh, standard of care treatment. Now what does this have to do with big data? Now the data we are looking at is pretty large. So in principle, per patient, the data we collect is in terms of uh, a couple of terabytes, which is like uh, 100 times uh, uh, the uh, storage capacity of your mobile phone. And of course, you collect this data not only for one individual patient, but you can consider all the historical data you have collected in a given university hospital together with the internationally available data to come up with a with a system which actually learns while you add additional data from individual patients. And, and this was actually the most, I think, successful intermediate results we obtained from this exercise is that we could actually increase the clinical success rate just by computational approaches, by collecting and aggregating big data uh, by about 40 to 50%. 
And this is without any change in the way how we, uh, how we uh, look into our patients with respect to diagnostic techniques, no change with respect to the uh, underlying computational infrastructure and methods being used. It's just a consequence, a mere consequence of aggregating large-scale data in clinical care, in uh, clinical genomics care. So what we learned from this is, yes, in principle, it makes an awful lot of sense to aggregate data, collect data, and analyze and uh, consider this data in the context of large-scale data being collected both in-house uh, in, in but also, of course, uh, externally. So, so that sounds very promising. So the question is, why can, uh, can't we scale this up to any kind of, let's say, um, uh, disease indication beyond cancer? Uh, why don't we just simply integrate all the imaging data, for example, and we will certainly hear, hear more about this uh, from my colleagues uh, here in the panel later on, and of course integrate the, this smoothly with electronic health care data. Now, the, question, the, the answer to this is that in theory everything is possible. And technology-wise, of course, there are big challenges to be met, uh, like, for example, the data throughput only in my lab is about the same scale, so about 11 terabytes of data per day, which is exactly the same scale as Twitter pu uh, produces and processes tweets per day. So these are non-trivial problems and data, um, uh, data, analy uh, data analytics uh, challenges, but they can be all solved. It's just a question of uh, development, further um, research into this area, and of course product uh, development. The, the problem is that in theory all this data can be brought together if we are only developing those systems, but in practice there are manifold um, uh, reasons why that doesn't happen. So if you ask me, and this is from my history at the University Hospital in Heidelberg, I'm sure in Berlin it's pretty much the same, how much data as a researcher you would have, av have available without requesting explicitly uh, for this data in a clinical care, from a clinical care context to be repurposed and reused in research, the answer is very dramatic. It's zero data sets. So, in, so what we would need to have a ready translation of uh, data collected and generated in a clinical care concept into research and also retros uh, retrospectively then back into clinical care is... Uh, um, is regulations and laws which actually defines the, uh, the rights but also the duties which are uh, bound to data being collected and generated in the clinical context. And if you look into this in different countries, and this is an international uh, conference, so it's worthwhile to look into um, the systems which have been established both uh, uh, by our European neighbors but also from uh, those uh, across the Atlantic, United States or in Asia, uh, the very bold statement is that integration and uh, ready integration and usage, reusage of clinical care data in a research context works in a context where regulations have enabled uh, the system to readily deliver data not on request but automatically uh, which is being generated. And in Germany, the answer is very depressive. At the moment, we don't have these regulations, and we need to uh, uh, change this um, uh, as soon as possible. Austria, Switzerland, it works uh, very nice. Also, our Scandinavian neighbors, uh, they have regulations in place which actually allows to share data, of course, not freely, but under defined conditions and under regulated uh, conditions. United States, uh, the... Uh, passed a law four or five years ago which enforces digitalization across all the, uh, all the hospitals. And within three or four years, you see a rapid increase in the degree of dig digitalization. So, so after all, what we need on the national but also international scales is our frameworks, regulatory frameworks, which actually allow us to generate, share, and reuse data in both directions, from clinical care into research and from research into clinical care. So with this, uh, I think I have uh, filled my first five <laughs> or ten minutes, and uh, 
I'm happy to discuss this later on once yeah. we have heard the other statements. Thank, thank you very much. And I think we are collecting statements now and we'll do a, a joint discussion, discussion afterwards. So um, I would like now to hand over to Dr. Bernd Montag. Um, he has been trained as a physicist, uh, as I understand, but um, has spent uh, many years in, in the health industry and is now the CEO of Siemens Healthcare. And I should probably better say Siemens Healthy Nias. Thank you. Very well put. So now I know how it feels like to be a movie <laughs> sitting here, interesting. Um, or the guy who sells the ice cream in the movie. <laughs> okay. So thank you. So when you say I'm trained as a physicist, you imply that I'm not trained as a CEO, right? <laughs> so no, no. I mean, it's, perception is reality. So, so um, short. Uh, what, what I want to. Um, um, say my, my beginning statement, basically three things. On the one hand, why this is so important, um, big data, what we do about it, not in the sense of a commercial break, but just to how does it feel like for a company like us, and then um, where I feel um, the most important steps are for all of us, and, uh, um, and, and that most of this is, I think, happening in our minds. So, number one, why is this so important? I mean, for, for us, big data and AI is more or less two sides of the same thing. Yeah? Just collecting data is not doing the trick. It is about applying um, artificial intelligence about, um, and, and, and um, making more use of the data. Um, I believe the promise of big data and digital health, this is really where big data and artificial intelligence play a role in mankind. Yes, you can look at... Uh, whatever, you know, traffic in restaurants or, or avoiding traffic jams or weather forecast and so on and so on. But the real challenge is when you really make, a, make, make an impact on human life, it is a more difficult problem because every episode in medicine has a, some percentage points of research in it. Yeah, it's not repetitive like a visit in a hotel or whatever or how you rate a hotel. It is really about impacting life. Um, there's data privacy and so on and so on. And, and one important thing is to th look at these challenges at positive challenges. This is really what is fun about it, solving these challenges, the cybersecurity challenge about it. Yeah? So the vision we have in mind is um, to, that in, in a foreseeable future there is a digital twin of everyone, yeah? which is um, the result of all the examinations which have been done, all the medical episodes, that there is this, so, so that we imagine a digital twin, that we have a big data collection in a longitudinal sense, which constitutes, so to say, the digital twin of yourself, and that these digital twins form a cohort and you can compare your digital twin with everybody else's digital twin or digital twins who have lived before you and you can apply better medicine in the sense almost of population health management. Yeah? So this is the intriguing future um, we want to go to. I think all of us want to go to. Yeah? And it's a, I think it's an inspiring thought. What we do about it and a little bit of thoughts on Siemens Health in years, to some extent, one can say this company has been founded because of the digital transformation of healthcare. Yeah? Because of the paradigm shifts in healthcare, it is better to have our own, uh, to have our own destiny, not to be seen as one part of the overall Siemens, but to have the entrepreneurial freedom to take what is to do what is necessary in in this in this rapidly changing world. We. Look at us now, and I come in my last point to how I think it is important how one looks at oneself. We look at us as the decision-making company in healthcare. Sometimes I say as the GPS of healthcare. We want to create the global positioning system of healthcare where we can sort of, we, one can so to say see where is a patient on the journey to health and what is the next step. This is what we do with our um, products in medical imaging, in lab diagnostics, in minimally invasive therapies. Yeah, we have 240,000 patient episodes per hour 
on systems we have produced. We have 600,000 um, pieces of units of equipment out there. Yeah? So one of the big homeworks we have is making the promise of digital health possible based on the excess we have. We take a crawl, walk, run approach to this. Yeah, maybe some of you know in the uh, in the science of the self-driving car. Yeah, there's a there's five levels of autonomy of cars. Yeah, so we start in the very beginning by using AI and big data to automate processes. Automating means automatically a patient is recognized on a CT scanner. Trivial examples here. And automatically, the right dose is applied, the right, uh, p the right image quality is ensured, and so on, and so on, be with, based on algorithms which are based on big data and artificial intelligence. The next step is better diagnosis, computer-assisted or AI-assisted diagnosis. And then it becomes interesting, yeah, because then it comes to treatment recommendations based on longitudinal data as a level three and level four, then treatment recommendations really based on all the digital twins which are collected of people. Yeah? So we are working step by step, um, working our way up. Yeah? We have we are very systematically um, collecting a data lake of curated images and, and patient data with um, now more than 300 million data sets applying supercomputers on this, enrich our offerings with these type of things here. Yeah? Then, number three, what I believe is super important is to make big data and the promise of big data in AI, in AI a reality in healthcare. We have to bear in mind that the healthcare system has been created without these possibilities. There are roles and there are certain system related. There's hospitals and insurers and, and there's education of physicians and so on and so on. All the system has been designed without the possibilities in mind. And it would be completely wrong to assume that the new possibilities will adjust to us, to our current understanding of our roles because then we don't use the new opportunities. We have to, we have, we have all to change how we look at ourselves so that we make best use of the technology. For us it means, and that's why I said, we look at us as the company building the GPS of healthcare. Why do I say this? Not only because it sounds nice, but it is a big transition whether you say we are really good at building imaging equipment yeah, we are German engineers and we are really good at this, or we are building um, the GPS, we are a decision-making company. It's a different way to look at yourself. When you are a physician, are you proud of the knowledge you have learned, or are you proud to make use of the, of the most modern technologies in AI? Or do you feel threatened by it? Are you proud of using this and that you can focus on other things, on all the things which AI cannot do? Yeah? And the third topic is super important. In many countries, um, the healthcare system is very fragmented and that is why the access to data isn't really there. Yeah? So we had one impressive last week, we had a um, conference in Siemens Health Engineers where one <laughs> Customer, or you know, one one uh, one um, professor from the Weizmann Institute spoke about their data lake of four million um, insured people in Israel, where they have longitudinal data for 20 years. This is a real competitive advantage. Yeah, when you look to Germany, the system is very fragmented; data are all over the place. In the US, maybe the system is not as fragmented, there's not this um, stationaire and ambulant and so on, outpatient, inpatient, but still patients only stay for one or two years on average in one system. Yeah, and then they change. So how can you 
benefit from longitudinal data when the base is not there. Yeah? So we also have to bear in mind that a lot of the use and a lot of the progress will not depend on technology, but will depend on how do we make our systems ready, our healthcare system, so that we can share data so that everybody can really benefit from it. Yeah? It will not be that the technology needs to adjust to us. It is also about us really changing our systems, our way of thinking to the technology to make full use of it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I mentioned that you're a physicist because I wanted to imply that you're a smart person. So, <laughs> um, so our next uh, panelist is uh, Nicola Perrin, and she is head of data for science and health priority at the Wellcome Trust. And here I should interject that I, uh, the Wellcome is my favorite funder, I have to say. I've, I've not received Wellcome funding, but I know what the Wellcome is doing, and it's, it's really uh, cutting edge and, and pushing the envelope, envelope in, in terms of uh, funding. Um, her particular expertise um, is innovation in health systems and data sharing and the use of patient information in research and also in improving access to clinical trial data. And I think that's what we are also talking about. So thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you for inviting me here today. There are undoubtedly huge opportunities in making better use of health data, whether for individual care or improving health care and services across a whole health system. We've been asked not to talk too much about the hype, though, so I'll focus on a couple of examples to start off with, because I think it's really important that we do all remember the opportunities as well as addressing some of the challenges. So if we take the example of cystic fibrosis, in the UK, a relatively small population of patients with cystic fibrosis, but an extremely high-quality data set in their cystic fibrosis registry. Information in that registry has been used to improve drug development. They've identified new targets for drug discovery and speeded up the process of drug discovery. They've also been able to give patients wearables and apps and use that for remote monitoring. And in that way, they've been able to spot infections much earlier than usual, prevent hospitalizations, empower the patients, and undoubtedly saving lives. And finally, most recently, they've been able to take the same data and work with the Turing Institute and use AI to identify and predict which patients would find a lung transplant most effective. Three very, very different examples, all within one disease cohort and the same sets of data. But you could argue that's not necessarily big data. It's a relatively small number of people with cystic fibrosis in the UK. There are lots of other examples I could begin to give with big data and AI, the most recent one is the, um, a, a paper that was published in Nature Medicine a couple of months ago from Moorfield Eye Hospital and DeepMind Health, where they've analyzed more than 2 million retinal scans. And from that, they've been able to train an algorithm to identify more than 50 eye diseases as effectively as the best eye experts across the world. They've trialed this already, and they're being able to use it to prioritize which patients should be treated most effectively and most quickly. So there are huge opportunities of making better use of AI, whether initially that's to speed up diagnosis, to detect disease, or I'm sure soon clinical support decision making. But what are the roadblocks? I don't think it's going to be the technology. That DeepMind example, they keep saying that it spent, they spent two years to clean the data and one day to run the algorithm. The technology isn't going to be the thing that's the roadblocks here. Access to data definitely will be, and we've been hearing about that already, and particularly comprehensive, high-quality data sets about diverse populations. We can't train all our algorithms on a few very small populations that don't represent everybody. We also need to think about the workforce, and it's a very different kind of workforce that we're looking at. The worlds of data science and biomedical research and clinicians don't naturally talk to each other. Data science is much more agile, we move fast, we break things fast. Within the 
clinical biomedical research world, it's much more hypothesis-driven research, and the context is really important. So we need to think of new ways for data scientists and clinicians, epidemiologists, biomedical researchers to work together effectively and to help them talk the same language. There are clearly ethical issues. Privacy is the obvious one that's always discussed, but I think we also need to think about accountability. How do you explain a black box algorithm when you can't really see what it's doing and how it's working? And how can somebody consent to their data being used in that black box if, again, they don't know what's happening in it? And that opens up big questions from a regulatory point of view. Within Europe, we've had the new data protection regulation. There's still a huge amount of confusion and complexity within the regulatory framework. And we're only just beginning to think how you regulate an algorithm. How do you, at what point do you decide an AI tool or software is OK if it's then continuing to learn when it's in the clinic? So I think there will be many, many more conversations about regulation and accountability. But I think there's another conversation that we need to have as well, and that's perhaps the most important one. We've already heard that there aren't any patients on the panel today, but I think none of us can ignore the importance of patient confidence and public confidence in the use of data. And also the healthcare professionals and clinicians also really need to be able to trust how the data is used. Health data is personal, but it's also very sensitive and confidential. And we need to respect that. At the moment, there are a lot of bad news stories around and high-profile data breaches, whether it's Facebook and Cambridge Analytica or many others, undermine trust. And that trust is very fragile. It's very easy to destroy. It takes a very long time to build up again. So we've been thinking a lot as to what one needs to do to try and improve confidence and to try and understand it a bit more. I think the cultural context is obviously really important. Each country will have a slightly different relationship with data and a different conversation to be had. But it's still a lot of the same issues. And whether or not people are more concerned about companies accessing data or in Africa it might be much more about having local ownership and equity sharing. It's still fundamentally issues of trust that we need to be thinking about. If we look in the UK, the starting point is really an incredibly low awareness of how data is used. All the surveys suggest that only about one in five people feel they understand what happens to their health data once it's within the national health system. They don't really know what happens for their own individual care, let alone the idea of researchers or companies being able to use data and software and algorithms being trained on it. But at the same time, generally, people are very supportive about biomedical research using health data. Most of the studies suggest that about 70 to 80 percent of people are supportive, but only when they know enough. Initially, because they know so little, they have a lot of questions, a lot of concerns, and they need those questions to be answered. So the most important thing is really to be able to explain to people why it's important to use data and how it's kept safe. We can't just do one. You have to do the whole package in a conversation. And that will become even more important when we start thinking about AI. There's been much less in the way of public attitudes work to find out what people think about AI. I think if you ask the question using the phrase AI, you get a very different answer than if you use the phrase machine learning, even if you're actually talking about exactly the same thing. People will respond to it in very different ways. And there's a real risk that this area is being over-sensationalized, over-hyped, it's not yet delivering, and it's sort of very confusing to people and it sort of gets wrapped up in robots taking over the world. So we need to be very clear exactly what we mean why it's important to use this data, how it's going to be used, and how it's going to be kept safe. Because fundamentally, people, when they understand a bit more, they do actually think that healthcare is one of the areas where there's the most opportunities for using data better. They, they get the potential and that it could transform their healthcare. But what they really most want is that human interaction. It's still really, really important to people that they have the doctor-patient relationship. So when we're thinking about use of big data and analytics within healthcare, we need to help make sure that that complements the delivery of that human interaction rather than replacing it. And by demonstrating the benefits of using data, we can help both patients trust it, 
but also the clinicians to be trusting it because that healthcare professional group is hugely important in explaining why this is so important and making sure that we get it right. If we get it wrong, I think there's a real risk of a backlash in the same way that we've seen with GM crops. If we get it right together, we can make sure that data does save lives. Thank you very much. Um, so our next panelist uh, will be Barbara Preinsack. Um, she's Professor of Comparative um, Policy Analysis and Deputy Head of the Department of um, Political Science at the University of Vienna. Um, just uh, in our conversation, she told me that uh, she has left. She was at UCL uh, London um, for te King's. I, I was confused. King's in London. I'm, so, I'm sorry. At King's College in London, um, had a position there for 10 years and just left it because of Brexit. So I think uh, that's quite remarkable. Um, she's a member of uh, a number of important committees, um, including the European Group, Group on Ethics in Science and New Technologies, uh, which advises the European Commission. And her research includes um, health policy practices, social and ethical aspects of personalized medicine, data-rich practices in science and medicine. Please. Thank you very much for the invitation. I should just say for the record, because King's is still my second employer, um, I'm, I was very sorry to leave King's, um, but it's true that I did it because of Brexit. Okay, we are already in politics. Um, I, w I was going to start with um, an anecdote. Many years ago, when big data started to be a household name, I went to a multidisciplinary meeting, and we had to introduce ourselves by answering the question, what was the biggest data set you've ever worked with? So you could say a lot <laughs> about the psychology of this kind of big data evangelism, but I want to draw attention to something different here, namely to the political economy of what is going on. And I will um, underscore and pick up um, at many, ish at many uh, points that Nicola has already very helpfully raised. I will talk about three things that I think are very, very important to consider in connection with digital health and digitization of health data um, to, to sort of show what the political dimensions are. One is datafication, one is personalization, and one I will call the, um, the, the sort of role of data in our society, which sounds very vague, but I hope I won't be vague in, in, in what I say. So the first thing is that very often digitization is, is, is seen as synonymous almost with something else which people have called datafication. So is this just a label or what does it mean? Datafication means that more and more domains of our bodies and lives are being exposed to data collection that were previously not exposed to data collection. So for example, when we use mobile phones, um, activity trackers, we are capturing data from aspects of our lives that we just didn't capture data from. Um, so experts have talked about the end of structural privacy, meaning that privacy is, is, is disappears from those areas merely because of the fact that we collect data, not because of any nefarious breach of privacy and trust on, on, on anyone's side. So, so that is, I think, quite significant because Another concept in this domain is function creep. You know that once the data are there, it is very, very difficult not to use it, and sometimes we should use it. So I'm, I'm definitely not um, one to, to be against uh, the use of data to improve healthcare and to improve, to improve other aspects of life. But I think there's a very important mechanism here. Years ago, the social psychologist Shoshana Zuboff already drew attention to the fact that the process of automation and information are distinct. What did she mean by that? If we automate something, and in today's language, we could say if we digitize something, we are producing additional information that then suggests certain uses. So for example, think of car tires. Car tire manufacturers are nowadays um, producing tires with sensors that give information on um, the temperature of the road, and so on, and so on. And all of this information becomes information surplus that you can build new applications on. Or think of somebody who has the idea of selling books online, such as Amazon. 
Um, once you have all the information on what people buy, you can create a business around, <laughs> around um, utilizing and analyzing the, the, this kind of surplus information about what they like. And now I'm coming to the next point. Because personalization is often discussed in terms of, well, personalized medicine and personalized health is often discussed in terms of should we do it or not. Personalization is already taking place. It's personalization is something that happens in every aspect of our lives. And it's not whether or not we should personalize, it's how we should personalize. So um, the, uh, one of the precision medicine initiatives in, in, the U in the US, while in Europe we were working on um, a report on, on personalized medicine at this time, so there are slightly different labels used. Um, in 2011, this report on, on precision medicine said we're supposed to replace disease-based taxonomies uh, so, sorry, symptom-based disease taxonomies with data-rich characterizations of patients at health, at any stage of health and disease. This is exactly what we heard. So this is a classical case of, a classical example of seeing that digital information is created and then, because it is there, lends itself to personalization. So I think that is a very um, important um, movement and, and, and development and one that we will not uh, reverse. So now we should have a very, um, we should have a discussion as a collective, as a society about how we personalize. And the third um, aspect is what I will call the role of data in our society. So data are, digital data specifically are called the new oil. The economist calls it the new oil. Other people call it a new currency. And here, the words that we use to describe this are not arbitrary. Um, if we call data oil, it suggests that data are something, a kind of natural resource that are already there, and that the corporations that make them usable, and that refine them like oil, are the ones who have a moral right to earn them. And what is invisible in this is all the, the, the effort and work and value that patients and others have created in making these data sets usable. So this is something that also Nicola already indicated. It is very important to create systems and ways in which the benefit and the profits that are created with data are, are shared with the public and coming back into the public domain also in, in, an, in, in, an, in, in the process of, of seeing and rewarding um, the affordances and investments that publics and patients have made in creating the data in the first place. So data, one of the solutions to deal with this is very often to now uh, monetize data at the, at the individual level. You may have heard of suggestions by some experts that patients should now be paid for their personal data. I think that's a very, very bad idea because it would just be the commercialization of even health data. But if we consider data a kind of commons, something that, that belongs to all of us and that should be used um, to the benefit of everyone, I think that that is a way to enable the developments that we've already heard to use, um, to use digital data to personalize healthcare. The last point that I want to make here is that we should be very careful not to, we should be very careful and cautious to see some of the new divisions in society that we already see becoming manifest. And these are along the lines of data use. So the cash rich people can pay for all kinds of services with money. So we pay for, you know, we deposit our data in secure um, data repositories, we pay for that. We use tools and instruments, we don't use Alexa. We don't use those instruments that are cheap where, you know the saying, um, if the service is cheap then you're the product. So we're not buying those uh, instruments where the real business model hinges on the data collection, but we buy the, 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 the instruments and technologies where our data are safe if we are cash rich. If we're cash poor, then we pay with the data. And this is not something that only happens, you know, in the online domain where you get free services when you allow your data to be used, but we've already had a company a drug company um, in the U.S. that uh, gave gave um, gave uh, drugs um, 
uh, cholesterol reducing drugs in this instance um, at a discount when people agreed to be uh, transparent in terms of their personal health data. So I think this is a, di a division that we should, amidst all the enthusiasm, and much of this enthusiasm is correct, amidst all the enthusiasm about what digital data and personalized medicine can do, we should not forget that we have a collective responsibility to m make sure that people are not hurt by this and that, that nobody is left out and it doesn't become a, just a benefit for the few. Thank you very much. Uh, this brings us to the last statement and it uh, is by Stephen Sen. He was until recently head of statistics group at the Luxembourg Institute of Health. He now runs a statistical consultancy for the pharmaceutical industry. And through his, throughout his professional life, uh, he has worked in industry and in academia. His expertise is in statistical methods for drug development and statistical inference. And I should say that among statisticians and clinical epidemiologists, uh, he has almost mythical status. And that is, um, I think, uh, because he's widely known for being a very outspoken advocate for methodological rigor and data quality. Stephen. Okay, thank you very much for the information, uh, the invitation, sorry. I have uh, some good news and some bad news for you all. Uh, the good news is I'm Swiss, so I'm going to try and stick to time. The bad news is I'm a statistician. This could be the longest 10 minutes of your life. <laughs> so, is there a huge scope for personalized medicine? On the one side, we have the believers, just about everybody, the pharmaceutical industry, regulatory agencies, life science journals, the big data files, the people who love big data, all sorts, and the politicians. On the other side, we have the unbelievers, these miserable cynics, statisticians. And statisticians are the, big, the bad fairies of research. Why? Because nobody really wants us to be there. When we turn up, we're rude, and finally we send everyone to sleep. So these are my personal opinions. I'm going to pick up some examples of problems to illustrate the point. I'm going to be picking on one aspect. Please bear in mind, I'm going to be critical here, but not everything that's written by the people I'm critical of is bad. In fact, I'm just picking up on one particular feature I'll explain to you. Uh, and that finally, to warning, the difficulty of statistics is regularly underestimated by everybody, including me. So here is a statement. First of my people, I was talking about the pharmaceutical industry. This is Sir Richard Sykes, at one time the uh, chairman of uh, GSK. And this is what he says. Uh, we're going to have uh, individual patients targeted, and we're going to minimize the problems, and we're going to really improve efficiency, and we've got an era of wonderful exploitation of the human genome ahead of us. When was that said? 1997. So you're all very young, but I've been here a long time. I've been hearing about all of these particular promises for a long time. Now let's have a look at the world's most feared pharmaceutical uh, agency. Uh, I apologize to anyone from the European Medicines Agency here, but it's not you. It's the FDA. And here they have a particular document which is paving the way for personalized medicine, October 2013. I know we're going to say that's yesterday. That's prehistory. The field is moving so fast. Why is he showing us something for 2013? Well, I'll defend my particular choice in a minute. So where did the FDA get this information on responders and non-responders? By the way, they have a number of Irish dancers there. Those are the ones who are not allowed to use their hands. And they have some Scottish dancers like this. Uh, and they then give you some figures about who responds and who doesn't. But let's have a look at this particularly weird one at the bottom, cancer. Cancer, what does it mean? Cancer. What on earth is cancer as a disease? That particular figure is a mixture of testicular cancer, fantastic success, and lung cancer, not so good. And yet, for some reason, the FDA thinks that this is a scope for personalized medicine, despite the fact that we already treat those two things uh, apart. So this is where the FDA got it. When did the FDA got it? Get it? 2001. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, the FDA believes that in 12 years, there was no progress whatsoever in the pharmaceutical industry in treating patients because they're prepared to cite data which are 12 years old to prove their particular case. Why are they citing data that's 12 years old? Well, I'll give you an answer later, if you ask me. So where did the FDA get the data? Well, in actual fact, as I've already said, they got it from this particular publication here, 2001. But where did those people get the data? 
Well, they very helpfully tell you. They tell you where they got the data. What they did was they looked in the physician's desk reference for 2000. Now, I'm not a physician, but I can tell you already, without ever having looked at this particular publication, there is no way it could give them this particular information. It's completely impossible that it could have this information. And so uh, I would like to cite Wolfgang Pauli on this. Not only are these data not true, they're not even wrong. There's no way in which you could actually take any data and prove that they're wrong. So here's another one. This particular article has been cited a number of times. Quite a nice article. This is by Nicholas Shork here. I've decided to replace all the little figures he has because I don't like them by some dots instead, but I'm a statistician. And here we have numbers needed to treat for a number of particular diseases. And then what he says is for every person they do help, the 10 highest grossing drugs in the United States fail to improve the condition of between 3 and 24. That's really, really serious. But in fact, it's not true. It's not true because numbers needed to treat cannot be interpreted this way. I don't want to go into this in detail. That's a whole other lecture. Uh, that will be several lifetimes of torment for you, quite frankly. But N of 1 trials do not tell you, contrary to what lots of people will think, what number of patients respond and what numbers don't. A high number needed to treat basically tells you the drug is not very good, but you can't distinguish between it not working very well for lots of people or working well for some and not so well for others. So here's a quote from me. We tend to believe the truth is in there, but sometimes it isn't, and the dangerous will find it anyway. So this is my particular complaint. We're all convinced that there's a huge potential for personalizing medicine. The evidence base, believe me, is incredibly thin. So here is a big data file. Now getting on to the next thing. This is a particular site, Healthcare Analytics. Six ways big data is driving personalized medicine revolution. And they're going to give you some data to prove that this is so. So another source of data, perhaps. Well, unfortunately not, because actually what happens is here we have the particular paper by Nicholas Shork cited in which unfortunately, although many aspects of that paper are extremely interesting, I'm quite happy for you to go and read it, I recommend it, but unfortunately numbers needed to treat simply cannot be interpreted in this particular way. And it's a fundamental error to think that they can. So here we have a politician. I am determined to do all I can to support the health and scientific sector to unlock the power of DNA. DNA is so powerful, and we're all going to unlock it. We know that. That's a wonderful thing we're going to do. And above all, we're going to have better care for patients. They're not present here, but we're going to give them better care with unlocking the DNA. And who is this particular politician? Far-sighted, very, very far-sighted. His name is David Cameron. <laughs> so... But in the meantime, in the meantime, there is a skeleton in the cupboard. What's the biggest source of variation in the system? It's not the patients, it's doctors. Here is some research carried out at Sheffield University in which they have a look at a number of units in which unfortunate women have been diagnosed as having breast cancer and are offered either a radical mastectomy or more conservative treatment. And what they find is they can throw anything you like at the particular a particular case mix to try and explain it, but at the end what remains as a particularly significant feature is the particular surgeon you happen to see, that's really, really important as to whether you're going to get a mastectomy or not. So speaking seriously, the evidence base regarding variation response is poor. My point is we're not even delivering average medicine well. And the, vet, the fact that different doctors are still doing different things for apparently the same information is an indication of this. A neglected source of variation in the system is doctors. We need to learn from the manufacturing quality control movement. They know that the thing, the duty of any manager of a healthcare system is to understand the variation in the system properly if they want to improve the quality of the system. And we are failing to do that. It's also well known that if managers interfere in systems in which they don't understand the source of variation, they can harm quality. And I don't want to be a cynic about big data. It's there, but the people who are using it will do better if they stop hyping this particular field and they realize that it's going to be providing interesting solutions at the margin. Excuse me. That reminds me that I have two minutes to shut up or commit suicide. Right. So, uh, finally, I will finish with a quote from Zhao Di Meng, who is a statistician at Harvard who's written a wonderful paper on the potential and the perils of big data, which I can recommend to you. And this is what he says, the bigger the data, the more certainly we fool ourselves. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you, Stephen. Uh, you lived up to the expectation. <laughs> okay, so um, I think we're, we're wonderful uh, with respect to time, so there will be plenty of time for exchange here at the panel, and, and I'm sure also there will be uh, comments and questions from, from the floor. So um, maybe um, I'm, I'm trying now to stimulate a little bit of the discussion here. So we had, I heard that uh, we, we heard about promise, we heard about societal, we heard about lacking um, the patient view. I was, not, I was not making joke in the beginning when I said that we, we are not having a patient uh, advocate here. Um, and uh, actually, a lot of the things that have been mentioned here, for example, the, um, the digital twin for some people is, is really a, a dystopian. Uh, for, for you, it's great, and, and I understand why, but many people, I think, think this is a dystopian um, thing. So how do we, how do we get this uh, together? I think there was, my, my feeling is that there is no one uh, on the panel, and I'm uh, not sure about the audience, and maybe... Um, if there is someone uh, who's, who, who thinks that data, big data, or aggregating data, if it is of a certain quality, is a bad thing in general. No one says that, and, and that's certainly not true for anyone at the panel. Um, but I guess the question is, how are we um, navigating this, um, well, th th this divide that is really there? And, and I think um, the... Uh, in, in terms of what we heard in terms of the um, the general population if 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 you are pitching those things not in an audience like this but but in the general population, I think that you'll you'll have uh, very and you said that i mean you have very different responses so how are we getting the use of of big data um, into a format which which is um, which is beneficial which is accepted? Um, and um, is not monetized in the sense that um, you, you have um, uh, warned us about. So um, are there any suggestions for, for, I don't know whether it's a middle ground, how do we get the quality in, this, um, in, this, in, the, in these data sets? How do we understand the algorithms? Uh, that, that, I think, was another thing that was mentioned. How can, we, how can there be regulation and trust in algorithms that we that are basically black, block, black boxes. So I don't have an answer for this. I'm not sure whether any one of you is can at least try to bring things together, or has or has um, specific comments uh, to uh, to each of you. Well, I think uh, with respect to um, making big data in health a widely acceptable. Um, metaphor or framework, I think we need to talk about the benefits much more. And I think we, there are so many examples already um, which actually show very clearly that with aggregating data in a certain context, you can actually do much better in the routine day-by-day day day care and um, of your patients. That's number one. Uh, I think our um, another issue which was brought up, we also need, at the same time, we need also to talk about the limitations and also uh, the potential uh, fears and doubts which are out there, uh, undoubtedly, uh, about what happens if I share my data with, uh, with an institution, uh, within a certain framework, uh, on a national, international level, in a regulated, unregulated way. And I think uh, it's, it's worthwhile to spend quite some time in thinking and discussing about those. And I, I really appreciate that, um, uh, that uh, I, I think, uh, um, the, I don't know, one of you two said that, that, uh, if, uh, uh, it, that we also should consider who is going to benefit in which way from aggregation of data. And are we running into certain issues or problems if we are considering um, data to come with a certain value? And if so, and of course there's value behind data, but how should we organize sharing and usage of those data? And I think there are different models, and actually let's call it business models. It's not so much a business model in terms of that a company should survive on it, but it's, it's like an operational model where we should come up with um, suggestions how we would like to organize 
um, uh, uh, aggregation and usage of data in the healthcare area. And I think we, talk, we don't talk enough about those kind of business or operational models. And I, and I think that's uh, something very important and that was highlighted, I think, by the two sitting on the right-hand side of myself. I think, I think we need to do two things. And, and a very small third thing, and the very small third thing is talking about the benefits of data, which I think are already discussed a lot. So if we think of the title of Eric Topol's recent book, it's called The Patient Will See You Now. And the prediction is that in the near future, 80% of all issues, of all health problems, will be diagnosed by patients and their digital friends. So I think the, 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 benefit of, the benefits of health data are discussed. I think we need a, a discussion about the realistic um, benefits and also the limitations, and I know that all of you acknowledge those. So what can compare? Computers, what can artificial intelligence do very well, but what do humans be do better? And I think in some areas the discussion goes a little bit into a kind of enthusiasm about reducing healthcare costs by replacing humans by machines. And we've seen it in the UK where, um, one, where the former health secretary actually believed that, um, Jeremy Hunt believed that um, it would be a very good idea to have uh, machines uh, interpret biomarkers and not humans at the same time as they were getting really, really harsh on junior doctors. So I think the, de the debate shouldn't be about machines and AI replacing humans, but we should think of what can humans do better and what can machines do better. And Nicola mentioned a very important point. Let's not underestimate the health benefit and the cost benefit in providing human contact. We don't even know what the economic effect, if, if, you know, not mentioning the ethical effect, what the economic effect of, of taking away human contact would be. The second we should do is we should create, we should not only devolve the control of health information to individuals. Individual control is very important. But we all know things such as alert fatigue, people get, we get asked over and over whether we agree to th something, whether we agree to the terms of services of this and that. So I think we need individual control where it's meaningful and like possible, and we need much more and better institutions of collective control and responsibilities of how data are used. So this is something we haven't even started to consider. The current institutions and legal remedies that we have are really from the paper age. They are not fit for the digital era. Yeah, um, three thoughts. I think there's one thing being responsible about big data, um, but it's also important, I mean, also not using big data is, can be irresponsible. Yeah, um, and, and not using the opportunity. And you know, when somebody goes to in the emergency room with whatever, and or, or somebody having a, a diagnosis and not offering this person the benefit of knowing what happened with 10,000 other people who did the same, who, who had the same condition is also a responsibility, I think. Yeah? So I think we have to be aware of this also. Yeah? It's, 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 it's a potential we have been given and now we have to, we have to do something with it. Um, Secondly, um, um, now I lost, lost the thought. Um, <laughs> um, I also, you know, when it comes to big data, a, a human factor of big data is how we train physicians. Yeah? And we all say that the more often a procedure has been performed, the better a physician is. Yeah? Or the more often a radiologist has seen a case the better he is, yeah? so it's part of every education. Yes? To some extent, this is the human version of big data, yeah? that we say you know, only experts can really do something. Yeah? And now it's, it's, I think we have to learn how do we deal with it when, when this learning curve can be done for special episodes by using new, by using technology. Yeah? And to the point of where we, uh, you know, one, one of our identities is to be the world market leader in imaging. We are very proud of it. Yeah? Um, but 
Um, that also means, yeah, we are, one side effect of this is that one of the most important um, customer group we have is ra radiologists. Yeah? And the discussion of will the radiologist be uh, replaced by AI is, is two or three years old. Yeah? Um, so one radiologist recently said, you know, I should charge one dollar whenever I ask get asked that question and I get rich yeah? <laughs> as a new model. Yeah? But I think the reality is yeah, radi there is staff shortage. It's, there are not enough radiologists in the world. There are more and more images. There are better and better images. And now there is technology which helps. Yeah, when whatever, when there is a traumatized patient and you look at which ribs are broken and you, as a human, you might overlook the, the tumor because you looked for the broken rib. Yeah? And this is what these algorithms help. Yeah? So I think we also have to be more educated now after in the second, third year of what, what some people call hype. What is the discussion? Is it really about replacing or is it about giving certain tasks which humans are not perfect at, yeah, which are either routine tasks or which maybe we humans do mistakes, yeah, that they are taken away from humans so that they can focus on what they are really good at. And I think that is the discussion we need to have. I entirely agree with that. What I'm not sure I do agree with is that we don't need to talk about the benefits so much because everyone knows about them, because I'm not sure they do. I think most of the news coverage is about the hype. It's the things that may happen in 10, 20 years' time. It's not the things that are actually happening every day. So I think if we're going to be demonstrating the benefits, we need to talk about what's happening now, and we need to do that in the context of, as you said, the digital health infrastructure or lack of it within health systems. Every clinician uses their smartphone all the time at home. They go into their clinic and they have to put their phone in their pocket. They have up one computer. They sometimes have to go onto another computer to open a different data set. They're still waiting for something that's come in the internal mail. This is the NHS anyway. I'm not sure if it applies everywhere else. Um, they still have to wait for a printed copy of a scan that was taken in the same hospital earlier that day and they can't see the patient sitting in front of them until that scan's been delivered five floors down. It's not a digital system at the moment. And so we're having two totally different conversations at the same time. But I think the way that we will persuade people is by really making a difference to the way they do their job. And that's the kind of benefits that help doctors do their jobs, and as you say, removing some of the routine work so they can concentrate on the really important issues. But then also I think if we think about something like imaging, that's a much more easily acceptable and accessible version of using data for people. because so they don't really feel that's personal or identifiable. It's an image and you're identifying a tumour from it. Why wouldn't you do that? So I, I think we need to start with the things that people can easily understand and grasp and that will help build confidence across the whole system. Thank you very much. Maybe um, at this time we should ask uh, the audience, and, and I see many hands, or already several hands. Um, so maybe we, <laughs> okay, we, we start down here and wake, uh, walk our way up. Uh, maybe you can briefly state uh, your name and, and where you come from. Thank you. Hi, my you... name is uh, Chloe Cassis Cronitz to the entire panel. I just wanted to share a quote that I think really captures and summarizes what you've been saying, and it's from a Digital Health Summit in London. And I, I, I've tweeted it to you, so you'll have a copy. AI will not replace physicians. However, physicians who use AI will replace those who don't. And I think it's a, it, it really captures what you're trying to say in, with two sentences. And um, I'm a dentist. I'm from Dublin. I work for a, a very large health uh, dental chain. Um, and uh, it's, it's apparent that we need to use these things. But, uh, and I also trained in Geneva, where they, compared to most of the other dental hospitals, have put microscopes on every single dental chair in their new dental hospital. For a dentist in, I mean, in most in the UK, very few will have that. It's certainly not in Ireland, certainly not even in Germany. Um, and I think 
AI is a form of calculator. Before we had computers, we had calculators, and it was before we did sums in our heads. So I'm just wondering, what are you, from all the different areas that you're coming from, how are you trying to bring in AI into the universities so that it then is required when these uh, young students become practitioners in the hospitals and the clinics and in the real world? I guess none of us is in, a, in, in the position to, to bring this into, into our medical schools. Uh, but I'm, I'm sure, I mean, you're certainly true that at the, I can only speak for the Charité, I can only talk about Berlin, that this is not part of our cur curriculum. It's not there. I mean, maybe as well, I mean, what we try to do, I mean, it is uh, what are doing is forming new ways of clinical cooperations. I mean, we have in, in, um, in our company, basically there's no innovation, which in the end isn't the result of a, of a cooperation with an academic hospital or whatever. Yeah? In the classic sense, when you have a new sequence of an MR scanner, when you have a new, uh, when you have a new test in the lab, it is always a product of, of, uh, of, a, of a collaboration. And, and clinical validation with a, with a scientific partner. And we are doing this now as much in the field of AI. Yeah, we are, uh, for example, in our quote-unquote hometown Erlangen, yeah, we are putting together a, a, a so-called digital health um, innovation center where we have the university hospital and the local university, the informatics department, and us teaming up working on these topics. Yeah? So I think we have to make it, I mean, we are not deciding about the curriculum of, 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 of medical or engineering education, but we have to make this a topic of medical research. Yeah? Um, because it's the same as in, in, in other developments, it is only the, the conversation of medicine and technology which, feels, which brings the field forward. And that means um, that this now is, is, is as important as developing a method in, in doing an imaging study, a lab test, or, or, or developing a minimally invasive surgical technique. I think we should move a little bit higher and then we come back to, to the lower rows. Um, thank you. Can you hear me? Um, I'm Abhi from Sage Bio Networks and University of Washington in Seattle. Um, uh, thank you, everyone. This was very enlightening. But uh, Stephen, uh, you have a new fan in the crowd. Absolutely adore what you said, and, and I think I admire you for saying that so loudly. Um, the, the question that I have is um, um, I, I'm part of the Precision Medicine Initiative in the U.S. That's a multi-billion-dollar effort, and uh, that basically gives me some tension in terms of um, the digital health that we are talking here in this uh, forum and um, how it uh, um, attacks or, or I guess addresses, that's a better word, in the developing world. Uh, I don't hear that and I think we still will be on the train, uh, we'll leave the station and uh, I don't think that's the right thing to do for, at least in this forum. I think you're absolutely right and I think the opportunities to make the most of the digital revolution in the low middle income countries is absolutely massive. It's something that Welcome is exploring at the moment. So it's somewhere where I think we could make a real difference to help with the leapfrogging. Can I just come back on the other training comment before? I, I love the quote, um, and you're absolutely right. There, there needs to be education at all levels. Um, within health education, so education for healthcare professionals, it's often just looking at what an electronic health record is, and that just isn't enough. This needs to be a totally different approach and a different mentality. Again, it's something that we're looking at with Health Data Research UK as to how you get a sort of training path up the whole career, looking at interdisciplinarity and trying to bring these different worlds together. But I think there's something more as well, that we can't just wait for the youngest generations, the people who are at school and college at the moment to be trained because we've got a whole workforce at the moment working in this really rapidly changing space. So we need to think of ways of getting training and flexibility and continuing professional development so that people who are established in their careers can be using AI as well. Somewhere up there. 
Thank you very much. My name is Claudia Stein. I'm from WHO Europe, and I'm the director of a division that deals with information, evidence, research, and innovation, basically everything that, that you've been dealing with today. Um, and I have um, two questions for you, but before I go there, um, at WHO we are struggling with the same things. We are people who receive data, who process data, who publish data, and um, we're just about to put together a high-level task force on big data because we see big opportunities but also big noise. And for us, we're struggling with two very basic frustrations that, that have also come up now and that I haven't seen resolved. One is that people mix digital health, artificial intelligence, big data all the time. They're different. They're not the same thing. Data are content. Data are data. Um, digital health is, you know, is infrastructure, is a lot of other things, is interoperability. Uh, AI is technology. So to mix these things, I don't think is that helpful. And it is really important, I think, to also differentiate what do we actually mean when we talk about big data. Are we talking about the content and are we talking about good data? Or are we talking about um, uh, infrastructures and kind of innovations that help us to actually analyze and report? And the other thing that has also not come up and that's frustrating us and we have no solution to that and we hope that the task force will help us with that and some of you definitely have to be on that task force is how do you actually define big data? There is no officially accepted definition of big data. I'd love to challenge you and I'd love to hear Professor Sen on that because this is really something that, that, that is so, so widely used. We're all throwing this word around here in, in this forum. What do we mean by big data? Can you perhaps answer that question? That's no, okay. I can't answer that question because I'm a small data person. I, I've, uh, I've, I've specialized in, um, in particular crossover trials and end of one trials. And actually crossover trials are very interesting because they provide you with much more than your digital twin. They provide you with yourself. Because what happens with a crossover trial is you match patients for, well, however many genes it is. It used to be 100,000 and one time it's 30,000 or whatever it is. But then, of course, since then we discovered epigenetics. Matches for all of that. Matches for all life history to date. Every single thing. doesn't have to be logged. It's everything you did until the trial starts. Then after that, of course, your life course is different. And it reminds me somewhat of a grandmother, Swiss grandmother I had, um, who I used to go visit her down by Lake Geneva, and she was very, very nice. But, you know, the second breakfast was always very interesting because first breakfast she'd say, what will you have the, today, uh, Stephen? What will you have with your croissant? And I'd say, well, I'll have some cherry jam. Thank you. Uh, and uh, the next day she said, would you like apricot or cherry jam? And I'd say, I'll have apricot. She said, how strange. Yesterday you had cherry jam. And one of the problems with all of this big data business is that one has completely neglected one particular important component of variation, and that is variation within the particular subject. And so what happens is that somebody who has a 10 millimeter reduction in mercury diastolic blood pressure is a responder. And somebody who has 9 millimeters is a non-responder, and if in a particular clinical trial you have 70% responders and 30% non-responders, then everybody assumes that what that means is that 70% of the patients will respond 100% of the time. But here's a radically alternative explanation. 100% of the patients will respond 70% of the time. And the question is, how do you distinguish between those two cases? Here's a really radical step. You measure the patients more than once under the same treatment. This is where crossover trials and end of one trials come in. And one of the things we fail to do is to understand variation. That's very important. But big data is about other Vs. It's about volume, velocity. What are the other ones? They're all Vs anyway. But, but, but variation, variation is the one which has not been understood by anybody else. And if I can make a particular, particular um, <coughs> advert for something today, this year is the 100th anniversary of the start of mathematical genetics. It was a statistician, R.A. Fisher, who started that, and also it was the invention of the term variance. And what he pointed out was, if you want to understand genetics, you have to study variance. And this is the thing which has been handled amateurishly so far in this whole movement, in my rather prejudiced opinion. Hard to go after this. But. I try. <laughs> so uh, one, one comment, I mean, but I, um, I think it's a good question. What, how do you define big data? I mean, there come, but there come, uh, there's a different, um, or maybe even similar thing. How do you define health? Yeah? And um, 
Yeah, so what is the baseline? Maybe a statistical problem. Yeah? And one thing the, the Weizmann Institute does, um, which I find pretty fascinating, yeah? with these four million patients or people they have in their, in their database yeah? and over 20 years is to define, you know, in, the lab, in a lab test, there's always this variance, what is normal, yeah? in a, what, is, what is the range? They, def they, they have a project to define what is normal, I hope you will like that, what is normal for this very patient. Yeah? Because health is a personal thing. Yeah? And defining this yeah, so that the variation for you, that, that one really realizes, okay, if you had suddenly my data, it would maybe be weird, yeah? but you would still be in the range. Yeah? So in these type of things, I believe, make a lot of sense yeah? and are things which, I mean, I, I can't define big data, but I, I think this is one of the things you can only do when you take a big data approach. Yeah? And, and having a statistical definition of what is health, what is health for an individual would be certainly one of the projects. I would like to say something, not because I know or I would dare to say what big data is and should be, but I think one element, well, besides the, the four, five, six Vs, there are different understandings of how many Vs next to velocity and volume and, and veracity are. Um, besides the V approach and the approach that people say, Big data are data sets that are too large for any existing infrastructures to deal with in the widest sense of the word. What a lot of people associate with big data is a particular epistemology in terms of uh, searching large data sets without a hypothesis. And I think this is something that is not, of course, entirely new, but this you know, predictive analytics is coming into healthcare. And this is why I think we cannot, although I totally agree that we need to really clarify what we're talking about, but we cannot really entirely separate those processes from each other because the availability of data sets that can be mined and of analytical methods that can look for associations um, where we don't start with a hypothesis and these, uh, these associations become actionable because in, in the largest, in, in a large uh, segment of the population they work. Whether this is good enough really depends on the practical context. For an insurance company it might be enough. For a diagnosis it might not be enough, but we, we are getting to a point in some cases where the lines become blurry, where we can say, especially if we think of um, um, algorithm-based uh, decision aids for diagnosis, the difference between an association and something that we know has a causal pathway underlining it is sometimes quite blurry. So I think this, this idea of a hypothesis-free approach to, towards data is one that many people associate with uh, big data, um, in healthcare, and that we that, that raises particular issues, and obviously shows in, shows in, and yields in some cases very interesting uh, insights as well that that we need to pursue further. Maybe Roland has a definition. <laughs> well, I think it's not so much about uh, having a proper definition, and we heard some of the definitions before. But I think they, um, there are different aspects which might be by themselves very interesting and make big data or any data set very interesting and such. We can term it big data. So you, you advocated for variation in big data, which is a very interesting aspect. Um, uh, I, would, I would like to come back to one aspect which was touched by Dr. Montake uh, in, in your, uh, uh, in your uh, uh, initial statement, what was not taken really up, is the velocity aspect. So um, I think in the ideal world we would start collecting data in whatever format, on whatever level, at the time of birth. And we should do this not only like at time of birth and then 20 years later, 40 years later, whenever you have a clinical encounter, but rather you should do this in a normal, healthy condition. 
And nobody knows actually how much that would actually, beyond anecdotal findings, and we have many of them, where we can predict, for example, the disease outcome based on blood sample taken at the time of birth. We can predict what is the chance to develop a certain allergy, for example, in five years' time after birth. And it's pretty pretty precise, this prediction. But this is anecdotal, and which actually shows how much we could do if we collected data systematically uh, longitudinally over your life term. And I think uh, what we would, would need to come up with, and it goes back to one of my earlier comments, is we need actually an operational model, a business model, whatever you call it, actually how we deal with those data. Who is the owner of this data? Who is going to benefit in which way from this data? So we need something which is not less than the Instagram of health data, which is used by almost everybody in the world using the same platforms to exchange data, and then we can start talking and discussing about what can we do with this data. But just to remind us, we're discussing very much about a theoretical case that there was a lot of data available. The fact is there's only very little data available, if at best in a disease state, but not so much about the healthy state. I think we should switch to this side because I've been favoring you over there, so maybe someone over there, yeah? Uh, hi. So my name is Ersan. I'm from Turkey, Istanbul, and I lived in Sweden for eight years in Karolinska. I'm a scientist-based entrepreneur who has a genome analysis company. Uh, we have analyzed 45,000 samples, and I'm very much into these, all of these discussions, and I'm also watching Turkish Genome Project, etc. So two comments. I think big data terminology is like next-generation sequencing terminology. Uh, the next-generation sequencing... <laughs> Sorry. Next generation sequencing was a false name because there's no next generation. It's going to be next or next or next. The big data is going to be small in maybe five years. Uh, right now, the definition is one terabyte. I mean, <laughs> they didn't say it, but like in Wikipedia, you have that definition. Uh, it's, of course, wrong because you can just reduce the data and it's going to be smaller, but still big data. Anyway, so that's my comment. My question, and maybe to redirect this discussion a little bit towards a uh, concrete benefit of big data in genetics. Uh, you know, the co our company was successful because we could put together the genetics data in a local region and uh, reserve the data back to the clinicians as a residual data. So they can actually understand what's a normal mutation and what's not a normal mutation. So this is a solid benefit of uh, putting together things, but then, this is obvious, and I think everybody knows this, then the problem is where we are gonna be in five years, and I'm really curious about what Siemens CEO uh, thinks about this, because uh, who is gonna get what? Because we need to set a normal, and all the companies, I think, and academics needs to go towards that direction. I have some opinions, but I'm really curious about your opinion, who, about the genomic data, like, you know, when I go to a hospital, do I have an option, like, you know, saying, don't use my data at all, because right now it's not the reality. Right now, you have to donate your data in a lot of parts of the world uh, to be able to get any kind of clinical whatever <laughs> that is. So this is one concrete problem of big data. And then the other side of the reality from the company side is that you actually need that data for humanity to go forward. So it's not a good thing to not give this data to companies because companies are not evils. I mean, not always. <laughs> so, 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 you know, that this, we have to, as a company and a scientist person, I have to use this data, but I, I am looking forward for you guys to come up with like some kind of a common sense suggestion in which companies can evolve, and at the same time, we don't steal anybody's data. Thank you very much. Okay, not an easy one. <laughs> so I start with a private opinion, yeah? So this is, um, and, and that is when it comes to who owns the data. I, I believe, yeah, and this is uh, that everybody who benefits from a... I forgot the most important thing that I would say. There was a science paper yesterday. Uh, I'm just, I don't know if they hear me. Uh, genome hackers show no one's DNA is anonymous anymore. This is yesterday. It says that 
in two years, 60% of US population is going to be identifiable through any kind of sample on a, on a, on a uh, currency. Okay, so I come. <laughs> okay, ah, that's what. Okay, so, so, um, and I believe. So the, again, this is the thing which I, or the statement which I want to mark as personal. Um, I think that when it comes when in an in an episode between a patient and a physician, when a physician gets better, when or when 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 the system learns and that is happening today, yeah? in every, even without big data. The physician gets better, with hopefully, yeah, with each patient he or she treats. Yeah? There's no algorithm, there's no technology behind it, but I think that in a, in a social system, yeah, every patient should, it should be part of the deal in a social system that the knowledge about what works and what not yeah, is in an, in, a, in, a, in an anonymous way becomes part of the system. Yeah? The system which is carried by, 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 by society. Yeah? I mean, it varies by, by, by country, but I think that should be the default. Yeah? And to some extent, and that's why I make the example, to some extent, this is happening today without big data. Yeah? Um, the question becomes interesting now when it comes to you know, um, um, who owns you know, um, technologies and so on and so on. And I think that, that um, we need to avoid and that the, that the same well, that the same happens as, as happens in the business in the consumer world yeah where, where the platform companies so to say own everything yeah like in the facebook or in the google way and, and so on and so on and we see our role for example as the ones who help aggregate the data who help build clinical decision support systems and so on yeah to help facilitate yeah, that the knowledge which is generated, that it's deployed. Yeah, but we have to, and uh, uh, but, but we have to make sure that this doesn't become a system where it is monopolized in 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 a, in a dangerous way. Can I just add? I mean, it was an important second comment that you made. That I think the your, the digital twin. It's naive to think that the digital twin will be anonymous. It, it is, it's not anonymous, so this will... Well, I, I think that's a part of the educational job we have, to t uh, we have to carry out. There's nothing like anonymous data. It's only a question to which degree uh, the data is anonymous. And this, there's a full body of theory and methods uh, around that. So, but we, first place, we have to explain to everybody donating data that there's a risk. And of course, genomic data is, is one of the front runners of data which is never ever anonymous. Simply, it's, it's as much attached to your personality as the fingerprint of, of your thumb. And so, uh, but, uh, but then you have to add, well, sure, I mean, you can uh, de-identify individuals from their genomic data. But at the same, and this is not new, I mean, you cite this paper from two days ago, but there have been more than two dozens of papers showing under which conditions and which additional information you actually require to de-identify, I mean, anonymized uh, um, uh, genomic data. But, but the question is, is it legal to do so? So in Germany, in the United States, it's illegal to do so because it's a misrepurposing of data which is not allowed. And that's what we add when we inform our patient, when they, for example, agree and consent to donating their genomic data, we inform them explicitly that there is a risk of being de-identified, that your data is never anonymous, it only is to some extent can be kept anonymous, and, uh, but that under proper regulatory systems, like we have in place in Europe, in the United States, and many other countries, and, uh, this, it, it's not a wild market, so to speak, but it's regulated what you can do with this data, and this is very important. Maybe 
someone, maybe someone up there because you're on a, at a disadvantage. <laughs> so, yeah, in the very back. Thank you for an insightful panel. My name is Elizabeth Chi. I co-founded um, a health tech startup in Switzerland. So um, three comments here. One is that I think um, Dr. Prinzak, you said that monetizing patients' health data is a bad idea. Um, personally, I think it is a bad idea if the patient is not involved. And uh, we as consumers are actually at the bottom of the data economy, like it or not. The moment you have consent your data to be donated to research, we all know that it gets monetized and re-monetized without the real consent of the patient or the individual. And um, my question is actually to the panel is that given there's also a lot of fear, especially here in Germany, so I've been in Germany for 11 years, uh, there's a lot of fear about oh, data privacy, etc. But the fact that the moment we download an app, it's a freemium, you are the product. So um, what, what, what can we do to actually, down, to actually um, reduce that fear and also encourage you know, more collaboration, more sharing, rather than having more systems that don't talk to each other? Um, if you look at current healthcare challenges, majority actually stems from data and information exchange issues. So uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you for that. I, I did, I th and I think here we, we disagree, although we might come from similar places in, in, in a way. Um, I, I do think that monetizing data at an individual level is a bad idea. So what do I mean by that? I think, I think that paying people in return for sharing their data is a bad idea for two reasons, because we are incentivizing those who need money to sell their data. And the second is because I'm not sure data should be something that we should sell. We could now you know, go into an argument about whether data could be seen as, as, as an, an analog to bodies here, but this would, would lead too far. So I think you, if I understood you correctly, you said that you do think that it should be monetized at an individual level if the patient has control. I think I understand where you're coming from, but I think if we think it through, at the end of the day, it's a bad idea. I'm not against monetizing data in general. I think if we can create value for our societies that also has an, a financial economic effect, that's wonderful. But just the idea of paying people for giving out their data has a lot of unintended consequences, I think. And there's a, there's a good reason, in my view, that Europe has had this tradition of not... Uh, considering uh, personal data as something that is governed by um, individual property rights and can be sold in that sense. I think when we're talking about when we're talking about value, we need to be careful not to only think about the monetary value because I think there are a lot of other ways that we can count the value. And that there's both the cost of creating the data in the first place and curating it and getting it the high enough quality, but there's a lot of other benefits that could come back to the health system or the individual. And I think in a number of bits of work looking at public attitudes to commercial access to data, people hate the idea of their data being sold, but they'd be even more worried if they thought the health system was giving the data away to a company for free. And I think the thing that stops that is if there's a benefit back to the health system. So whether it's a reduced rate for the service or it being spread across the whole of the health system. But I, I think if we focus too much on the money, it distracts us from the wider benefits and the broader value. So my view here is I'm worried by the developments in a way, but I take the sort of ethical perspective of John Rawls, which would go something like this, that if you want to benefit from the data of others, as a patient and the research and the data of others, you have some sort of a moral obligation to share your own data. Now, that is a basic ethical starting point that doesn't necessarily transform, transform itself into any uh, particular legislation, but that's a way maybe one should start thinking about it. There are other areas in which this particular ethical conflict arises. Um, being unwilling to enter a clinical trial 
uh, where actually you're not at any particular great risk because you demand that the doctor backs their best hunch, but you're benefiting from all the previous patients who entered clinical trials, or, for example, refusing to vaccinate your child because in a world in which everybody else vaccinates their child, that's the logical thing to do. So the, these are difficult societal uh, problems for us to face, but we have to start with some sort of idea that there is a certain quid pro quo. So there's, there are really many hands up, and I just want to be uh, inclusive here. So uh, I think you had your hand up very up for a very long time. Yeah. Thank you so much for your discussions. My name is Daniel, and um, I finished medical school last year, and I'm currently doing a master's in healthcare technology in Tallinn, Estonia, and here in um, Germany, in Regensburg, in the Bavaria area. Um, currently, my thesis work is focused on um, using CNN, that's uh, convolutional neural networks, in analyzing radiological scans. And um, my question is focused on um, what, uh, what are the different stakeholders, and uh, that's both the public and also the private industry, doing in terms of, um, you know, sort of like encouraging um, radiologists or other healthcare professionals to adopt the use of this um, proliferated um, technologies like AI that is coming. Uh, especially in the in the areas of concerns like how machine learning we use or reuse data, or how, uh, how who is going to be held accountable in the areas of um, you know clinical decision making uh, using these technologies. So I just wanted to get your opinions on what is going to happen um, going forward. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> Uh, we have these discussions on a daily basis. Yeah, I mean, currently, I mean, um, there was the statement which I which I can only uh, 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 fully agree to. Yeah, the radiologist will not be replaced by AI, but the radiologist using AI will replace the radiologist not using AI. So that is the radiology version of that quote. Yeah. Um, so currently, when we sell. When, or when we have a product, an AI-powered product for radiology, whether it is using the, the, the scanner better yeah, and for optimizing automatically image quality or helping to read, yeah, it is, it is um, marketed, to use that term, very commercial term, yeah, it is marketed as a tool to help to basically automate, to have to to help to be productive, yeah, and take le uh, to take burden away, yeah, so that instead of ten minutes for reading a case, yeah, when you, um, you need only six minutes, yeah, um, because this, the the um, um, the the algorithms help you, they highlight things and so on and so on, but. This is still marketed as a help, but not as something doing the work completely for you. Yeah, also from a liability point of view. Yeah, so it's, and that's also why I used this example of the different levels of autonomous driving. Yeah, it is something where we say, hey, this is this is like cruise control and automatic. You know. Uh, um, the, the car is, so to say, very aware of the environment and, 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 and so on and so on. But the statement is clear, keep your hands on the steering wheel. Yeah? At some point in time, we will overcome this. Yeah? But that is a different regulatory topic. Yeah? When we really say the diagnosis is completely done by a system, but then you have to really go through all the clinical trials and so on and so on and, and have to go through the rules of, co of institutions like the FDA. Yeah? But currently, it is very much a productivity, I mean, sorry for the industrial term, yeah? it's a productivity tool helping to avoid mistakes, but the ultimate responsibility, the ultimate ticking off, this is the result is um, with the physician. Thank you. Uh, down here, you also had your hand up quite a long time. I apologize for all that. <laughs> I think you're next because you also had your hand yeah, up. Yeah, thank enough. you very much. Uh, I, I would like to applaud the panelists. My name is uh, Charles Sivinjira from Makere University. Uh, I'm a, a surgeon, but at the same time, I'm a, a 
have specialized in ethics. My question is to Barbara. Uh, I'm just disturbed to learn that there is no regulation for AI in Germany and that a few countries in Europe have these regulations. And my worry is what is being done at the international level to come up with regulation? Are the codes of ethics, are they, I know most of them could no, uh, may not be effective. What is being done to protect the vulnerable populations? What is being, because a lot is happening at the moment and we know that a lot of data has been collected, particularly from Africa to America to Europe. Is that data safe? And uh, can't, it be, can't it land in wrong hands and be uh, used for the wrong purposes? Thank you. Thank you. This is a very, very tough question, and I won't be able to do it justice in what I will attempt to make a short answer. Um, depending on... Well, it's not f entirely fair to say that there's no regulation on AI in Europe. Um, so, for example, the new um, European Data Protection Regulation contains um, provisions on automated decision-making that could also pertain to AI. But I think that the, the, the core of your question was about how can people's interests be protected and what about um, also data that are, as you mentioned, collected in Africa and then are, are travel, traveling to other areas. And I think um, it would be, well, there are some emerging um, solutions for international frameworks for the use of artificial intelligence in, in healthcare. Um, there are also some attempts to try to um, get people to commit to some sort of ethical code themselves. But I think, again, one aspect to keep in mind is whether globally we do see an asymmetry in where data come from and whose benefit they are used for. And I already mentioned some divisions in societies where, you know, as I mentioned, poor people pay with their data, rich people keep them safe. But there's also a bit of a global um, um, trend to, to that. So one of the divisions, and I'm talking a lot about divisions today, although much of my own work is actually about solidarity, not divisions. But another division is, you know, whether people are active data producers or whether they are passive data deliverers. And a lot of, uh, in a lot of cases, um, populations are used to um, get data from, for example, as in exchange for airtime in so-called emerging markets. So these are not genomic data. In the genomic data domain, we have a wholly different problem that a lot of the genomic medicine is he heavily draws upon um, European populations and Southeast Asian populations, but a lot of other populations are underrepresented. So, but this is kind of going around AI. I think when we, when we talk about AI, we also need to talk about what data are actually used for it and what, um, what do those uh, AI applications learn and how do they use them. So these connections we need to look at in conjunction and there's, there's, it's clear that there's no um, global solution for this, no international regu regulation or, 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 or um, regulatory framework, as you say, and there's still a lot to do. And it touches upon all kinds of issues. Maybe now the gentleman in the white shirt. Can you, can you please use the microscope? Okay. Uh, no, the microphone, not the microscope. Okay. No microscopes in this room. That's fine. Uh, normally I prefer to not use the mic, but uh, no, my, my point is also that uh, you're concerned about multi-trillion dollar companies dominating the scene. And if you then consider this from poorer countries in the south, it's much even worse, because even the poor countries like Siemens or whatever that might only be worth, you know, 100 billion or 200 billion <laughs> is actually a big, a big sort of foreign agent here. 
So I just wanted to put out, I completely agree that there's lots of potentials. You need to accept that there are benefits going both ways. But in order to assess whether that balance is kept, you need information about how that data is used. And I don't see that being almost on the agenda at all. Because what has happened with all the other data that we voluntarily or involuntarily is actually submitting all the time through our apps is that we have no clue where it ends up. I tried, I'm a computer scientist, I tried to figure out how many digital pro footprints that I've left a few weeks ago, and I just gave up because they were, I was like everywhere. And uh, so, so we need some mechanisms here. And we have seen with the pharmaceutical industries how they try everything they can to undermine patenting rules, right? Repackaging things and double the prices overnight and all kinds of things, right? This is going to happen with data too. We need to find mechanisms for that. And my second point was just power. Nobody has used that term. But, you know, what really concerns a lot of us is really bad, evil use of this kind of data. And what we have to remember then is that, yes, this year we might have a decent government in country X that takes care of its citizens, that is not using it for political repression or dragging people in and chopping them up or beating them up or sending them into concentration camps, whatever. We don't know whether the government that is in power five years from now is going to do the same. And history has shown us that the systems we put in place for assumingly good purposes, can then be used badly. So again, power is a critical thing here, and we just need to keep that in mind all the time. I don't want to be uh, victimized, you know, 20 years from now because they have data about my father and my mother and my uncles and my sisters, half of them dead, and they are now using it to figure out that, ah, this guy is a troublemaker. <laughs> Steve, Steve. Yeah, you have my sympathy. I just want to pick up on one thing that you said, um, and I should declare an interest. I used to work in the pharmaceutical industry, and I still consult for the industry. I predicted uh, back in the year 2000 that data sharing was coming and that the pharmaceutical industry would do it sooner than academics, and this is what we've now found. In actual fact, although there was uh, quite a lot of resistance and it was the all trials campaign and all of that, in actual fact, the pharma industry is leading in sharing data. That may be good or it may be bad. There are different points of view on that. But when it comes to sitting on data or not publishing clinical trials, and actually it's the academics who are proving to be particularly difficult. I think that is a very fair point. I think the interesting thing, though, is that when pharma companies are making trial data available, it's not actually necessarily being used as much as people would like. And I think that's another really interesting conversation in its own right as to why it's not being used. Um, I think I agree with your comments there. I think one of the things that it's important to think about is what we really mean by transparency and how you have meaningful transparency. And there's a lot of discussion as to whether or not one should give feedback to every individual patient about how their data is used. I'm not sure how helpful that would actually be because I think out of context, you'd be really not only surprised but confused why your data goes to some places at particular times. I think what we actually need is a system-wide transparency so you understand where data flows in general around the system and how it's used and also who makes the decisions and I think that comes back to your point about the power. It's understanding the decision-making processes to have access to the data and ensuring that those are accessible and comprehensible and transparent, I think, is probably the solution to some of this. So um, I think we should have maybe the last question from the audience, and then I'll ask the panel. Yeah, the gentleman in the blue shirt. Is it Peter Grabitz, I think? Yeah. While he's uh, waiting for the microphone, I'll, I'll warn the, the panel that I'm going to ask, because we, we are not going to have a... Uh, a summary of this, but maybe you can come up with one sentence that you take home or that you want to take people home if you have one. So, Peter. It's, it's actually a green shirt, but I, uh, I won't complain. Sorry, and, sorry, it's so beautiful. I'm, I'm, I'm Peter, I'm a, I'm a medical student here, and I have a very quick question, um, which is, are we measuring what matters for 
a bit of background in a lot of healthcare interventions, let's say clinical trials, I bring this up because this is what I'm used to, we measure overall survival, we measure um, quality of life, and sometimes, and this is already discussable, we measure surrogate endpoints, which does the tumor grow or not. But I feel for a lot of apps that take the power and leverage the power of big data, the first thing we measure is download of the app and how well it would perform to, let's say, usual doctors. And maybe that's a question rather to patients. Is that what really matters? And are we doing well in assessing these potentially new and revolutionary healthcare interventions? It's a tricky one. We don't have a patient here. Stephen. Yeah, it's a very difficult question. All I can say is from the clinical trial perspective, when I first started working in clinical trials, I thought that what we should be doing is we should be measuring how well the drug did what we wanted it to do. I later changed my mind and said that really what we should do is we should measure what the drug did. Because this is one way in which you can actually personalize decisions. Because different patients have different utility functions. And if we knew very well what it was a drug did, uh, for example, uh, this would in fact uh, improve your multiple cirrhosis or at least it would just slow the rate of decline quite considerably but it leaves you at a risk of having a rare possibility of a severe brain infection, then different patients might make different choices there. Um, the problem is if you try and wrap that all up in some clinically relevant uh, endpoint, then that's a, that's a problem. Um, I'm not sure whether that really answers your question or not, but what you can always say is that... Um, uh, certainly uh, what statisticians tend to do is they tend to measure what you can measure and real life somehow slips between. Okay, so we're close to the end of this panel uh, and I apologize to all of you that have not been able to um, make a statement or, or have a question. Um, maybe uh, some of the panelists are still here for a few minutes so you can approach them. Um, so maybe I can ask uh, you for, for kind of a final one sentence statement that you think is important we should take home or that you took home from this discussion. It's tough. But <laughs> I'm not sure I can answer that, but I'm, I will say that I'm glad that the discussion ended with a question about value. Some of us were in the panel on value-based healthcare before lunch. And I think here is an area where a digital data and big data methods and AI, they're not the same thing, but all of these can actually really make a difference. But this will, of course, not happen automatically, but we will have a really, really um, complex and hard discussion about not only how to measure value, but what value is. So what matters to people, what matters to patients, and how can we increase the value of, of healthcare in that respect with digital tools and, and, and the technologies that we have discussed here? I think it's been a really interesting conversation and particularly around the sort of definitions. And I think I'm not sure it's helpful to define big data, but I think one of the things that is particularly striking is that we're talking about data about populations and you need to have that population scale in order to improve the health of an individual and I think it's that switch between population and personalized which is where it gets really interesting and where we've seen perhaps the greatest benefits from some of the genome studies and Genomics England the, the biggest impact has been on those with rare diseases and who haven't yet had a diagnosis who get a diagnosis through the system those people you would expect to in some ways be most concerned about their privacy because they're potentially the most identifiable, but they're the people who are the most supportive of their data being used in that way. So I think we need to keep the perspective at the same time. Yeah, I, I think we, uh, we need to get to a next level of discussion and that is I think everybody agrees or I would be surprised if anybody does not agree yeah, that the three topics, digital, data, and AI, will have great benefits for better medicine and also for more affordable medicine. I believe everybody agrees. Yeah, so we, we, we need to look at it as if this is the 
most effective drug which has ever been discovered. And yes, we discussed the side effects. Yeah? There's, it comes with side effects. But I think what we need, we are now in a phase where we have to reverse the burden of proof. It's not that digital data and AI need to prove that they are of value because we all agree that the potential is huge. Yeah? It is now our responsibility that this most powerful drug in this analogy finds, it way, finds its way into the system in a responsible way. That's my point. Well, since you said what I wanted to say, I have to dynamically think of something else. But I think what, what is really important is that, uh, and you mentioned this and it was also touched upon uh, by others here in the panel, I think we should remind ourselves that data sharing is, uh, is, uh, is going down to a social responsibility which we have to pay back to the society. And I think uh, if I wanted to raise a wish for the next panel discussion, uh, I think it was good to start off with a very general topic. I think it, we should invest much more time about uh, uh, thinking precisely about ways how we want to generate and share data and who will be benefiting from this um, data commons. I think that's the term you coined. Uh, so I would also like to name it a data commons, which comes as, as some re responsibility for society and how can we make responsible use of this data commons. So I think there is a great potential in using data wisely, in particular to do better certain things that we do already. I am less convinced that we are going to do much better in terms of therapy. Um, and I would warn against imagining that we have, uh, we're going to realize some sort of a dream in which mathematics will triumph over biology. Thank you very much. Uh, and so that's my final statement. I would like to thank the panelists uh, for, for a very interesting discussion. I would also like to thank the audience for staying with us and discussing with us. And um, that's the end of the session. <laughs>